Hello everyone, my name is Paul Third and this week I'm going to do a few things today. One, I'm going to show you how you can actually view analog curves in real time using Access Analog and Bertram Curve Analyzer in DDMF Metaplugin. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how you can use that same setup if you route it a certain way where you can have the hardware via Access Analog and your plugin in real time and you can actually match the curves in real time using Bertram Curve Analyzer. In your DAW, you can actually have an analog curve, a plug-in curve, and you can actually match them in real time. Right, so how you set this up is actually quite simple, okay? So you're going to have two instances of Bertram Curve Analyzer loaded in to DDMF Meta Plugin. Now, the trick is to split the left and the right signal. So to get both curves and both kind of the hardware and the plugin to show in one instance of Curve Analyzer, you're going to split the left and right. So you're going to have um, the analog matrix, which is Access Analog running, say, to your left. You're going to have the plugin running to your right, then routed back into left and right of Bertram Curve Analyzer. If you do that, then what's going to happen is when you load Bertram Curve Analyzer, you're then going to have two signals working independently from each other, left and right, as I'm going to show you here. Right, so as you can see here, we have got um, one of the Pultex. There's actually two Pultex that um, Access Analog do. So, first off, what you can see is you can notice that in terms of just the standard linear frequency response, the linear frequency response is quite flat. Right, so that's what 100 hertz boost, and that's a little bit of attenuation as well. Okay, so that's what that curve looks like. So you've got quite a lot of non-linear random behavior in the lows, but overall the curves look pretty smooth. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and match the curves via the Noise Ash Realtek, which is actually my favourite Pultec. I actually prefer this Pultec over this analog and access analog Pultec. So I've sped this up, okay, because I did take a little bit of time on it. But as you can see, I was able to get close-ish. Close-ish, okay, that was kind of as close as I was able to get. Right, so let's move to the high band of the hardware Pultec. Now what's quite interesting with the hardware Pultec is that the sharp in the broad bandwidth is basically your Q of the high end of your shelf. So as you can see, the broad is just kind of maintaining a shelf, but the sharp is just, if, if you can class that as a bell, it's a very, 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 very wide bell. And again, I'll try and match the curves with Noise Ash Realtek, sped it up again. So as you can see, I've, again, I've managed to get close, but it's the high end. There is a high end dip or high end roll off in the Noise Ash Realtek that the, this specific hardware doesn't have. And that's something that you're going to find in all analog gear. There are going to be slight tolerances. Some gear is going to have different linear frequency responses and different roll-offs and different linear behaviours compared to different analog. Even You can even have five Pultec side by side and they'll have slightly different roll-offs and slightly different curve behaviours. So that's kind of as close as I've managed to get. Um, but again, there is still a little bit kind of in the mid-range, kind of low mid-range area that isn't right. So again, I went back to it and I kind of ended up with that being the closest that I can get. Again, I cannot match the high end, but again, it's not exact, but it's pretty damn close. So if I was to set up a comparison between the two, that would be the curves that I would use. I think that's as close as you're going to get. I don't think I can tweak it anymore. That was the closest I could get. But, but looking at them side by side, that is still pretty damn close. Okay, there's a little bit of difference in the high end, but curve-wise, it is very true to the hardware. I can get the curves to match near, near exact. It's very, very, very close indeed. So next up, we'll move to the API. Okay, the API 5500, which is essentially a stereo 550B. Right. So, as you can see here, there's way more analog non-linearities in the low end. So this is actually a 100 hertz bell using the hardware. So as you can see, there's like as much as like a 4 dB boost in the low end. And as you can see, there's a lot more non-linear behavior in the low end of that curve. So what we're going to do is we're going to stick the Waves API, which is very commonly used. Everybody swears by it. Now let's see how non-linear this Waves is. API EQ is. And as you can see, the waves is too linear. It's too linear. It cannot recreate the non-linearities of that low end. It's just a completely linear bell in the higher frequencies. And let's see how close the waves API matches. So actually in the other three bands, it gets pretty close, but really only because 
the 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 hardware curves are actually quite linear and they're very very wide so they're actually a little bit easier to recreate but as you can see in the high end the high end is a little bit off so just as you can see it's just a little bit off in the highs but the lows are nowhere near absolutely nowhere near but the rest of the bands are quite close now how about we try another plugin let's try the lindell 50 channel okay everybody was talking about the lindell 50 channel as uh, tobias lindell is extremely good at recreating analog gear um, using algorithmic plugins now what's very interesting is as soon as you load the lindell 50 channel as you can see it has that non-linear behavior in the low end. See how it's got that bump in the low end? And as soon as I start engaging the bell, the low bell, I can get very, very close. Look at that. Look how close that is. It's not perfect, but it's quite close. Now let's try engaging all the other bands and trying to see how close the Lindell gets to the rest of the curves. So as you can see, very, very close. It actually does a much, much, much better job in the high end. It's nearly identical. But I've got this little bit in kind of like the lows here that I'm not getting right. So I changed that. And as you can see, it's that's as close as I can get it. The lows, I've still managed to kind of match that kind of little bump in the lows, a kind of 4 dB bump in the lows. But um, I kind of have, by kind of boosting that extra line, the low area, I've kind of lost a little bit. So I couldn't get it perfect. But to be fair, to be fair, I think we can agree that that is pretty impressive that it's managed to match the non-linearities, especially in the low end. Again, um, the Lindell is static, but in terms of the curves, it's pretty close. And if I, again, if I was to do um, an AB or a comparison, I know that the curves are as close as I can physically get. So we've looked at two EQs. How about we look at a compressor, right? Just to see the linear frequency response of a compressor and why looking into the linear frequency response of a compressor is very important. So as you can see, there, there's lots of non-linear response um, in the Universal Audio LA2A. There's tons of it. I'll just look at it in the low end. It's just crazy. Look at the randomness in the low end. It's all over the shop. And there's a lot of noise in there. And it's, as you can see, it's making a lot of harmonics as well. It's very, very, very non-linear, which would make that low end an absolute nightmare <laughs> to model. But as we can see, as it goes from the low end kind of more right up into the end of the spectrum, um, you can still make out the curve. So as you can see, the um, Tim P, which of um, the Tim P Opto 32, which is convolution, as you can see, that's got more of a high end roll off. And then access analog, as you can see, that's kind of, it has like a bump and then um, it rolls off. And then Universal Audio, the Teletronics, as you can see, that's actually kind of got a full bump in the highs. So really, if you look at it, the LA2 has got quite a bit of a bump in the lows. It goes very flat in the middle, and then it's got a bit of a roll-off, where in the plugins, again, it's, they're all completely flat, and it's the high end that's changed. Analog gear is not static. It's not static. There's noise in there, and there's analog non-linearities. The signal passing through all the components that are creating all these non-linearities, harmonic distortion, and um, again, noise, just these non-linearities, again, in the low end, just going absolutely mental. That's the system. As you can see in the LA2A and stuff like that, you can have some units that are just absolutely non-linear. And again, they are creating a lot of distortion, a lot of THD, a lot of harmonics, and they're just very, very non-linear. Their system is just non-linear. And as they compress, it becomes more non-linear. Um, so it can be very, very hard to match. I mean, what I find interesting is that you can still kind of make up the curve, even though there's all this noise and it could sometimes be really erratic. You can kind of still make out the curve. And to me, it's so important to understand the curves when doing um, shootouts and stuff like that, because in a sense, that it is kind of a little bit pointless comparing those three plugins to that compressor. And I actually did it. <laughs> I actually did it with Tim P. Um, but it shows you that um, tonally, in terms of matching um, different EQs and different um, compressors or different analog units, understanding the frequency response is very important because every unit is going to sound different. Those three compressors are all going to sound different because their high end is different. So you could have four, five, six different LA2As and they could all have a different um, high end roll off and they'd all sound different. So that's why many people are quite firm when it comes to analog versus digital that 
the only real way of comparing um, a plugin versus a hardware is ensuring that you have the hardware that the plugin was modeling, because as you can see, there can be tolerances and variances in different compressors. And as you've seen in LA2A, there was such drastic difference from different LA2As. I'm not going to lie, guys, this process of using Access Analog and Bertram Curve Analyzer, um, the time it takes to match the curves, you are paying for this. So it's not going to be cheap. I don't have any discount codes or anything. But what I will say is, in terms of justifying it, right, I just wanted to say this very quickly. If you're thinking about buying an analog um, piece of equipment, right, could be like a two, three grand compressor or whatever it is, or like a, it could even be a four grand EQ, and you have lots of plugins that emulate that. To me, it's worth the 15, 20 quid, or however much it's going to cost you to match all these curves to the gear, right, 15, 20 quid to save you possibly 4,000 quid, right. In my opinion, it's worth it, right? If you're just mucking about, <laughs> kind of wasting your money a little bit if it's just experimenting, but you might have fun and you might just enjoy stuff like that and that's 15, 20 quid. Well spent, all right? So, like, subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you again next week on Fixing Wednesday.